لا لا انا مش مش هاخد معاك الاجراء ده هاي ريا هاي ويلكم تو جدة هاي تو How are you? I'll uh, speak in English so everybody understands me. Who's ready for a bit of Antonio Banderas this morning? We are. He's here, I can assure you. We're going to start with a sizzle reel of his beautiful career in a couple of minutes. And then uh, we'll have a wonderful conversation. One more minute guys and then we we need silence and clearance please. You're cold. <laughs> I was cold and, uh, and somebody borrowed me this, <laughs> a woman. And, um, yeah, a very nice lady had this handy for you. Yeah, she saved my life. Yeah. No, but I have to protect my, my, my vocal cords, actually. Exactly. I'll try not to make you speak too much in this in conversation. That's impossible. <laughs> That's going to be challenging. I, I talk a lot, actually. Uh, yeah, I have a tendency to homilies and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start a little bit with the festival and Puss in Boots, The Lost Wish, which uh, was projected last night uh, in the presence of very enthusiastic uh, children and their parents. Yes. How much you enjoy making those films because they're such fun for you and for the audience and because Selma is in them? It was strange because... I arrived to, to the United States and to Hollywood without speaking the language. Um, my first American movies, The Mambo Kings, uh, Philadelphia, the, the, you know, I have to practically learn the lines phonetically. So uh, the fact that many years after, they just call me just for the use of my voice, 
but no, my physical presence, uh, it was uh, weird, uh, very extraordinary. Um, I have been just with that cat for almost 20 years. Almost 20 years. Yes. The first time I, I did Puss and Boots, I was uh, actually working on Broadway. I was doing a musical. Nine. I was doing nine. And, um, and so I did my first sessions there in, mm. um, in New York. And um, I, I didn't expect at the time that the character was going to be that big, you know. If five movies now with him, and probably it's going to be another one. Probably Shrek is going to come back to the big screen. And, and, and if Shrek comes, I suppose that the cat is going to be in the in the bunch. <laughs> of course, because he's yeah. got those like nice eyes that yeah, you know, like make you melt. See, a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> <laughs> those eyes. They absolutely are. So let's go back to the beginning. Your dad was a gendarme officer. Your mom is school teacher. Right? And you loved football. So uh, is it correct to assume you didn't grow up thinking, I'm going to be a movie star one day? No. It was uh, <laughs> very, very far away from my early life. You know, I, I lived in a, in, a, in, a, in a city that there was no industry uh, of cinema. They, we had a theater. And eventually, companies from Madrid were coming uh, during the season. And my father and my mother, they were both very aficionados to, to theater. So, yeah, you know, my, my brother and I we were taken to the theater when we were little. And I loved the ritual that, that, that I saw. I mean, a group of people telling a story to another group of people was, for me, an act of civilization that was extraordinary. It's an art of 3,000 years that kind of um, allowed us to reflect about the human being and all the complexities and depth of uh, the soul of human beings. No? So, and I saw that very early and, and it called my attention very much. So my first passion really was theater. Was theater. Yeah, that was uh, how I got into uh, being an actor. I, I just, I remember loving older actors because I saw people with uh, 60, 70, 80s years old, still with the capacity to play. To play a game in which, you know, they believe what they are. And, um, and it was just beautiful to me, um, the capacity of, uh, of actors just to make believe, to adopt a different personalities and to um, actually reflect in, in art in general and in, in movies or in theater in, in particular, you know, Art serves many different purposes, <coughs> and uh, so it, you know it, it can be a comedy or it can be you know more transcendental things. But they are all important, you know. But uh, for me, the connection with acting has to do uh, with uh, with the theater, yeah. And probably you know it, that's why now I am back into that world because. Uh, we are living in a in an universe full of technologies, and and I am no I don't have anything against that, but uh, for me it was very important to to look for something more human that actually put me in contact with something that it has to do with the skin and it has to do with a contact physical contact, literally, as I said to you mm. before, group of people telling another and a story, another group of people, and nothing in the middle, no tricks, no nothing. It's something very pure, and so. When I suffered a, a heart attack in, on the 25th of January 2017, you know, theater came like one of those important things in my life that stay floating in my life. Many other things that were not important sunk, and I was not interested in them anymore. What stayed there? My daughter, my mm. family, my friends, my vocation, and theater. <laughs> well, because it, there's nothing like it. Look, show us a little bit of love, guys. There is nothing like this immediate feeling that you get from an audience. It can't lie, can it? No. No. Uh, uh, you know, I have that every night now, and I mm -hmm. wouldn't change that for anything in the world. No. I, I've done almost 120 movies now. And, and, I, and I have loved every one of them, you know, I love those moments between action and cut. For me, my profession actually goes from those moments. Yeah, action From action and cut, oh, curtain up, curtain down. Um, 
but the feeling that I have in the theater is something mm, completely different to movies, and, and mm. it's unexplainable. There is no cut. The story follow. You, you you go into three hours in which you get into a bubble that is very difficult to reproduce when you are doing um, a movie. Of course, it has a, an, another you know advantages. Um, for example, the the amount of people that can see. You know. I am in Madrid now doing theater. We are filling the theater every night. At the end of the three months that I'm going to be performing there, we may have 70,000 people maximum. Exactly. That is nothing for cinema. Cinema can <laughs> do that in a couple of hours. Exactly. <laughs> in one session, really, yeah. in some cinemas. Um, let's talk about Pedro Almodovar, uh, of course, because that's a unique experience in itself. Do you consider it as a turning point in your career at the time? Absolutely. It was uh, finding Pedro Almodovar, or he finding me, a change uh, totally. <coughs> not only just from a cinematic point of view, also from a social point of view. And Pedro Almodovar uh, changed the rules of the game of <coughs> Spanish cinematography because he was very daring. We were coming out of a dictatorship. Uh, the country was growing into a democracy. And, and uh, I suppose, I mean, I, I remember getting to be a man and coming out of my youth, my childhood, at the same time that my life was changing. And then there were artists that were coming with it. Uh, and one of those artists was my Lord, who uh, actually uh, pushes the boundaries of uh, social boundaries, morality boundaries, you know, and, uh, and at the same time, not only the content, I mean, the story that he was telling, but the way that, that he was doing it. Pedro Almodóvar has, has been very faithful to his style, always. He never bent in front of anybody. He never betrayed himself. And that is, for an artist, something unique. That you can count, probably, with the palm of your hands. Those, Those types of directors with their imprint. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Seven films you've done together? Eight. Eight, yeah. Eight. The last one was Dolore Gloria, yes. which you nominated for an Oscar for, and you won the Best Actor Award at the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, seven movies, seven different characters, same director. How would you describe that artistic arc together? Well, you know, at the beginning, Pedro, it, it came into the panorama of cinema mm. in Spain as, a, as a, a guy who could do very good comedy. Mm. Uh, so that was the, the way that he uses to connect with the people, and probably at the time it was the, the way to express his ideas, you know, in a way that was a little bit lighter. But uh, as he was just uh, growing, uh, he became more and more, uh, uh, you know, his movies were the depth of his movies, the, the profundity of, of it, the, the complexity of it, they, it was, they were showing more and more and more. He started losing a little bit the humor, and he was just putting something uh, on oh. the screen completely different, you know. From yeah, and so you, you grow as a director, I guess. Yes, and you have to think that for 22 years we didn't work together. That's the time for me in which I was working in Hollywood and I was doing another type mm. of movies, and uh, and suddenly I went back to him in uh, the skin I live in. Yes. That's the movie that we uh, reunited after exactly. <coughs> these 22 years. La piel que habito. La piel que habito. And it was a very um, daring film. And Moldova has been mm -hmm. always uh, l'enfant terrible de la de Spanish cinematography. He has been always just breaking all of those uh, uh, type of rules. And he bothered many people. But when you, uh, <laughs> you, when you express yourself in the way that he does it, you have to count that you are going to upset a lot of people. Uh, and, and, and you know, you have to be ready for that in art. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, there are many things in art that I disagree. But I have to admit that they exist. They have to, we have to um, uh, open to that possibility. And in movies, it happens like it happens in, in literature, it happens in paintings, it happens in many things. Well, that's my idea of what art has to be free, even if there are many things in there that I, uh, they bother me. You were very successful in Spain when you ventured into Hollywood. First of all, is it true that Madonna convinced you to go? And were you interested in uh, in opening up your horizons to Hollywood, the cultures being a little bit different between Europe and the States? Yeah, but Madonna didn't have really yeah. anything to do with that. <coughs> Madonna was an accident that happened uh, because she came to Spain. She she loved Almodovar's movies. Mm. 
and she came to Spain with her. I think it was called the Blonde Ambition Tour. Yes, yes. And I she asked if we were able just to have a dinner with her. Um, I didn't know that she was actually. I saw cameras around, but I thought it was just news. Mm -hmm. But uh, you thought it was for you? <laughs> no, 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 no. If I would have known that, I wouldn't have done the things that I did. <laughs> no, um, and suddenly she was doing that documentary. Mm -hmm. So, like a year after that, I was doing my first American movie. I finished. I remember, uh, and a couple of days after, I was still in Los Angeles where we shot the, the Mambo Kings, and. I received a, a, a phone call, and it was from Madonna. And I, I, at the beginning, I thought it was a, a, somebody was just uh, posting a joke to me. And <laughs> it was a prank. It was a prank. And uh, so I said, who are you? And she said, no, I'm Madonna for real. And I would like to have dinner with you. I would like to explain to you that I did a documentary, and you are in it. And she said, I am in a documentary that you did. I cannot believe that. So she made an appointment with me. She showed me, actually. And I said, sure. You know, I mean, it's going to be a promotion for me anyway. But, uh, and, it was kind of fun, but uh, but I was it. Yeah. And then it, many years passed until we did Evita. And it was and Evita went through many different ways. The first director of Evita that I remember was called Glenn Gordon Carroll, and I did a test for Evita in the studios of Disney in Los Angeles, and then nothing happened for a long time. And then Oliver Stone got in. And I remember having a conversation with Oliver in Miami. I know I tell you the condition is with <laughs> <Because, laughs> <Do ten. laughs> no, I'll tell you later. But, uh, but he signed me. You know, Im imagine how we were that he signed me a contract in a, in a napkin. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like Oliver Stone. Okay, here you go. So, he's still here, right? He's the president of the jury, so he must I know. still be here. <laughs> I know that he's we'll ask him tonight. <laughs> yeah, but he may not remember. <laughs> and so I did sign that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but he didn't do the movie. I, I remember he, he wanted Michelle Pfeiffer to do the movie at the time. It didn't happen. But the script was his. Mm. When Alan Parker came on, and Alan Parker finally directed the movie. And I remember I was doing a movie in Miami at the time uh, in which I met Melanie Griffith. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and, you know, Alan Parker came and he said, What do you think about Madonna? And I said, and I, thought, I, I think she's perfect. Mm. I think she is very alike in a way to Eva Duarte with her own. She had that ambition, she had that kind of uh, drive. And so finally she was taken to do the, the movie. And, uh, and it's a movie that I love, actually, because I love musicals, you know that? Exactly. And so we had the possibility of doing it in the biggest screen, you know, and, and properly. Um, Alan Parker is, was a great director, and Darius Kanji, a fabulous a cinematographer. I did a photography that was, you know, spectacular. I had been studying in, in schools all around the world, and and it was for me um, one of those uh, beautiful Hollywood moments. <laughs> well, that was my next question. Obviously, you, you spoke about Evita, Philadelphia, Interview with the Vampire, Mambo Kings, but then the Mask of Zorro happened, and then what happened to your life? I mean, who knows the Mask of Zorro? <laughs> First of all. <laughs> the, the Mask of Zorro came to me the night of the Oscars of 1994. Mm. And that was a very special night. I had to do a presentation at the Oscars that night. Mm. I, I was uh, presenting uh, Bruce Springsteen, who, by the way, won the Oscar for Best Original yes, Song. For the Streets for of Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And so, an Spanish director called Fernando Trueba. <laughs> with whom I work later in the movie I met, Melanie Griffith, won that night. And it's the best uh, international film, a foreign film, um, Belle Epoque was called film. And, um, and, and then at the end of the night, I remember Tom Hanks, um, who won the Oscar for Philadelphia, he dedicated mm -hmm. it to me, he said, to my boyfriend. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and so we went to a party of Elton John, and in a table, I remember there was uh, Stephen, um, it was Bruce Springsteen, uh, who else, I, I don't know, I, a Christian Slater, I remember it was mm. there too, um, somebody else, Elton John, and so, what well, Steven Spielberg says, what do you have to do tomorrow morning? And I said, nothing. And I said, can you come to see me in Amblin? 
Uh, Universal Studios, à la session. Je suis un grand plaisir, sorry. Bien sûr, je vais aller à mes pieds. Et donc, et dans le milieu de la conversation, aussi, là, dans une in a, in a party, il m'a dit, « Do you know Zorro, le character ?» Et j'ai dit, « Yeah, you remember when I was a, a kid, I was watching, you know, Guy Williams mm -hmm. doing the TV show. » Et on Saturday, after the same, I always remember that. Oh, yes. I, I, yeah, I, I, I loved it. And he said, would you like to play it? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So, okay. Steven Spielberg. So oh, let's, let's just uh, talk tomorrow and let's see what we can do with that. And then, uh, you know, it happened like that. Um, it, it was going to be actually Robert Rodriguez, the first director. Mm. Then some disagreements there and Martin Campbell came on. And uh, uh, so, yeah, uh, my, my daughter w was going to be born in Mexico. But because of that delay, she was born in Spain. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we went to do the movie, the movie in Mexico uh, when she was, uh, I think it was three or four weeks old. I remember taking her on the horse. I have a very f uh, feisty horse. It was yeah. moving all the time and it was, uh, you know, impossible. It was Duke. It was the name, the real name <laughs> of the horse, Duke. But he was just fighting me all the time. And I remember something very special. My uh, Melanie, who is a little bit crazy, <laughs> she gave me the baby. Let's say she's fun. For, for months, or, I mean, no, yeah. weeks. She was like this. <laughs> and I took the baby in the horse, and the horse. <laughs> there was like, let's be a responsible adult here. The horse was, he, he knows that he, that he was a, a, you know, a little really god uh, of a human. And so I just gave the baby back to Melanie and the horse started getting <laughs> crazy. But um, no, it was fun to play a character that actually represented the, the Spanish community. Let me just talk about this a little bit. Because when I arrived to the United States, doing the Bamboo Kings, Many of the actors that I work with, they said to me, if you are going to stay in America, you're going to play bad characters. You're going to play the yeah. villains. It's often the case, isn't it? Yeah. That's what we do here. Blacks and Hispanos, we are the bad guys. Arabs too. Yeah. Yeah. Arabs too. <laughs> Arabs too. <laughs> Don't forget us. So, that's why it was important that just a few years after, I got a mask and a sword and a cape and a hat and my face the horse and the bad guy was blue eyes, blonde and he spoke a perfect English <laughs> and that was important. That was yes. important because he introduced an idea in the Spanish community in America, um, you know, that uh, there was a space for us. And Boots and Boots is even better because he's talking to kids. So kids, since they are very little, they know that the good guys can have an accent. And, sure. and the bad guys can speak perfect English. <laughs> so these kind of things, uh, uh, movies can do those kind of miracles too. And, um, and it happened. Um, you know, uh, now we have a number of uh, Spanish actors who won Oscars or were nominated. Um, there's exactly. directors, Mexican, Mexican Argentina. directors winning Oscars year after exactly. year. And that is now kind of um, normal. There are many different steps that they have to follow. Yes, of course. That's why we were talking before, um, you know, with the head of the, of the festival. This festival is very important. <coughs> that consolidate itself in, in time because it's going to just bring um, all the talent of Muslim countries and Arab countries, you know, to the world. Um, and, and they open a space and say, hey, we have something to say. And uh, we want to do it on the screen. So um, I'm happy here uh, to defend that, uh, that idea. We are very happy to have you as well. <laughs> I want to ask you about um, your direct. You, you mentioned Melanie Griffith, your ex-partner, uh, who you directed in Crazy in Alabama, and then El Camino de los Ingles. Is that how we pronounce it? How important is directing to you, and how much was it influenced by all the great directors you've worked with? It, it has been important because it opens even the possibility of directing theater later. Yes. The ultimate goal. The ultimate goal. <laughs> but um, it's interesting because. For me, directing movie was a di discovering the, the real toys that you use to tell stories. And the powerful 
you know, the power behind the camera and oh, everything that, because I thought at the beginning, okay, because I am coming from acting, um, what I'm going to do as a director is just to dedicate my time to the actors to find their characters, is it? And you know, and it, it, I did. Why? Because when, when you are directing an actor from the outside, you can see problems that he's having performing that you had before. And when you are having those problems, it's very difficult for you to detect them and to just save yourself. But when you see them from the outside, you know exactly what is happening. And you know how to push a button that made them progress in whatever they are looking for. Um, and, and I can tell you a couple of stories after about that. But I discovered the power of cameras and the, how powerful it is. If I shoot a, a scene right now, our conversation, and I do it with a lens, or with a 28, for example, doesn't have anything to do that if I shoot this same scene well, with 150 and I use a telex. Um, it, the telex is going to allow me to create an universe that doesn't exist. And I am interested in that side of cinema. To tell stories that go to your brain, but they are not totally in, uh, uh, touchable reality. A touchable reality would be a 50 maybe, a 32 lens, but I prefer just to go to long lenses because I can destroy everything that is in front of you and I can destroy everything that is behind you. If I take a, a little bulb and I put a bulb 100 meters from where you are and I photograph you with 150, that bulb is going to be a planet. And if I move a little bit the camera, it's going to start moving in the background. And if I put five of those in different colors, you have an universe that you create and you can set up a mood for the character at the time that she, she him, is telling the story. So I got fascinated by the possibilities of lightning, the possibility of uh, using lenses, and the possibility of the toys that are behind yes. the narrative of cinema. It's How you a, edit can make uh, five different movies all together. The music, mm -hmm. the use of music. The music should be silent in movies. Mm -hmm. They should they should support the movie, but not, not be too prominent. If it's too prominent, it, it, you just leave behind the cinematic uh, fact. You know, music has to be there for what it is. But anyway, that's not an opinion. Eh? They may people who, uh, there are people around them may think in a completely different way. But uh, that's the, the way they. Uh, I was directed uh, in my second movie, El Camino de los Ingleses, which is a Spanish little movie. And I have a, a, an actor who disappeared now. Unfortunately, he died uh, last year. Juan Diego, fabulous actor. And he got to do a scene in which he sees a woman who he thinks is a lover of his, that she's dead. Yeah? And he wanted to cry, but he didn't find the point to cry. I said, Juan, you don't have to cry. I don't need this kind of uh, humidity, emotion. <laughs> and, no, you don't have to do that. But he was pursuing that. The night before, I shot a scene with a woman in which he was walking, drunk, and she just um, uh, accidentally broke the heel of his shoes. So in the scene, she, she fell in the ground, on the ground, and the next morning we were shooting when he finds her. So he was going again and again, he couldn't cry, and I got an idea, and the importance of little things. I went and I, I said, okay, motor, camera, and I didn't give him action yet. I was beside him and I said, look at his shoes, they're broken. And he says, yeah, 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 they're broken. He was just <laughs> thinking, I have to cry, I have to cry, I have to cry. And I said to him, you gave her those shoes. Action. Mm. And suddenly, the fact that he got that information that I gave him in the last moment, that he gave her to die, my real father died all in a movie. Of course, he was very strong to me. He was very, very impressive the moment I saw him dying. And, uh, and he was very strong. But what really, really, really broke me into pieces was that night when in his bedroom I found his belt. Yes, those moments. <laughs> when I saw his belt, that was the thing that really struck me and made me cry and made me just boom, break into pieces. 
the emotion in movies and for actors come from places very unexpected. Yeah, I completely agree with you because Absolutely. your assistant or the person that's with you is called Yolanda and that's the name of my mom and she came earlier and you said Yolanda and I could have cried in your scene when she came in because you called her Yolanda. Yeah. So this is, this is what happens in life and then you use it yeah. for yeah. film. Oh. Sorry. I will contain myself. <laughs> In Competition Oficial, you played an actor yourself. Yes. And so you just spoke about directing actors. What about playing an actor, assuming he was nothing like you? Or was he like you? Was it inspired from you? No, I hope that he's not like me. <laughs> no, I, what we do in official competition is to see all the ridiculous side of our business. The it, narcissism of acting. The, the, everything, and the stupidity. The stupidity, sometimes artists, you know, go to places that are absolutely stupid <laughs> in search for a truth. And, uh, and, and so in the official competition, what we see is that. Basically, we have two, two types of actors. A very serious, admitted actor Method. who, no, 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 even to a point in which he doesn't allow him, for example, to go in in, um, in, in super class in planes. He goes with the people because that, no, 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 he's a, a guy with, and the other one who is a star, a star. He got big cars, he does commercials, you know, a number of things, you know. And so he confronts these two ideas of, uh, you know, uh, being an actor and with a very crazy director who at the same time got a very narcissist personality. Played so, by Penelope Cruz. Yes, Penelope. And uh, so we got a lot of fun because many of the things that appeared in the movie are true. You know, exercises, for example, that actors do in, in, before getting into a scene, you know. And many of those things are coming from reality. I'm not going to say names. <laughs> no, no, but you got inspired but I by remember, I remember an actor that I worked with, a wonderful actor, eh, by the way, who was coming from the actor's studio. And every time that he was going to do a take, every single time he did this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what do you do? I mean, well, just, just, just to get into my character. <laughs> Cow here, you know. The first time that he did that noise, it scared me. I said, oh my God, what's going on? You know. So we do sometimes this kind of crazy stuff, and then I so I put that in the movie, and then I got a friend of mine also, and that was in theater. Every time that she was going on the stage, she said, "Grajo." Y, y Grajo y Cartagena. Cartagena, Grajo. <laughs> and then you see the other actors, you know, uh, and the, the, the character played by Oscar Martinez, who's very funny because he says, well, you know, that doesn't, you cannot use that for anything. I said, yes, I can do it. I can use it all the time. It, it's good for me. No, 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 you cannot do it. You're just taking me out. You know? So there is this competition all the time between these two methods of how to just access to emotion, to acting, to whatever. So that movie was uh, uh, very it. revealing. Yeah. Many people love it, but the movie didn't go do well because we criticize everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and the show, yeah, everybody takes a, a big slap. And so, I mean, we went to the Venice Film Festival. There is a scene in which we just destroy awards from film festival. And we took the, uh, the Golden Lion and we destroy it. Of course, we are not going, they're not going to give us that. <laughs> you burned the golden line. Exactly. You don't get anyone from us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that behalf, you know, an actor's life naturally is full of ups and downs and oh, yeah. lows and highs. Uh, how much do you entertain yourself with other things that you like? What are you a fan of? I know you're a fan of perfumes. We'll get to that later. Uh, <laughs> but sports? Yeah, I, I was more into soccer and football than I am now. <laughs> because Morocco beat Spain? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, Spain beat Morocco. 
did very well. They did very well. We're very they, proud. No, no, no. They, seriously, <laughs> I'm because of my proximity with Morocco. Mm. You know, I am from Malaga. I'm from the south of yeah, Spain. Exactly. Morocco is. I can see Morocco from my house in Marbella. The, the days of Poniente winds. I have a lot of friends from Morocco. My father was working for many years when I was the boat. And yeah, that's your hero in, in, in Morocco. And his friends, and who's, uh, they were Moroccans. And uh, so, I know the Moroccan culture was in my house. The cats, the, the hats, the, the puffos, the, the hagida soup, the couscous, everything was there. So, you know, I, I had a, a relationship with them. And um, I'm going to say something, I don't know if there's Spanish around here, but... Uh, there's more Arabs than Spanish, I'm sure, in the room. But <laughs> in a way, that much represented the personalities of what is going on in our countries now. A Moroccan sewer, you know, doing a strategy that they knew how to destroy the Spanish game, and the Spanish didn't know what to do. Yes. And so they were just passing uh, horizontally all the time but the goal is there and they were just there <laughs> and you're watching the match and say what the heck are they doing? you know and so um congratulations to morocco what the hell yeah. and it's going to be a good sport in everything anyway in life um, yeah i really believe in I that i love sports i think yes. a, you know they bring beautiful things to society you know and, and it, it always that we know past the limits of, of that, you know, it's a game still, uh, football. But, you know, for me to practice sport, I prefer other sports. I, I love to ski. For many years I've been skiing and I, and I love that, but, but that's, um, you know. I don't believe so much in soccer. I, I suppose that I don't believe it. Mm. Anymore? Mm. No. <laughs> I see things that, um, no, I don't like it. Uh, in, in football, it, it became a surprise that the, the defeat of the Spanish team didn't <laughs> hurt me. <laughs> yes. In some other time, I would have been three days depressed. <laughs> Italy was not even Here with my golf. I dedicate uh, the, the, my funds to do what I love, and what I love is to perform. So I bought a theater and I initiated a project called Teatro del Soho in Malaga, and I am very proud of that. It's one of the most important projects of my life, no doubt about it. <clears throat> I have, uh, I, you know, it's an incredible satisfaction to have a plan in doing exactly what I, what I want to do. So the perfume is allowing me to do exactly. things. That's very good. You always use the good for the good. That's perfect. <laughs> the profit for the passion. Uh, and it smells good. And, and it's apparently so. <laughs> How much do you enjoy Instagram? Uh, you know, social media is such a direct way to communicate with your fans. What is the best use for it for you? I am very, uh, what is called now politically correct with my mm. social networks. I, I try to be very neutral in everything. I don't go into big, big uh, in declarations there. Because there is a lot of aggressions there too that I don't like. So I try just to just keep myself out of that. I do, <clears throat> I'm doing a publicity of the show. Yes, you doing. promote what you do. Yeah, yeah and, and things like that. And sometimes I have an opinion, but normally uh, I try to, uh, to have a certain distance with uh, getting into controversials through that. Uh, I prefer other uh, media uh, to express my opinions. And one of them would be cinema, another one theater. Uh, the trailer of the new Indiana Jones is out. Mm, yeah. How exciting is it to be part of something that iconic? How was it? It's, you know, I'm not, like, my character is not very big, it's, it's, it's small. But just to be there is, is important. Just to be, just, just to, to work with Harrison. I, I worked before with him in, in The Expendables, but we didn't yes. have scenes together. But uh, just to be fr in front of Indiana, just the first day I arrived there, I think Yolanda was there too. I, I went to the makeup trailer. I didn't expect it, but suddenly I, I heard Antonio! And I turned around and I see Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> with his whip and his hat, and uh, Phoebe was there too. 
Uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge, fabulous oh, girl. Yeah, fabulous. Phoebe, oh my God, I love that woman. And uh, both of them is smiling and hey, welcome. <laughs> and it was beautiful. Just to, just for that moment, it was uh, awesome to be there. Uh, you know, I got, I got a, a good time. Though I was rehearsing at the time, so at the same time, so I had to be traveling to Sicily, doing a week going back to, to Malaga, rehearsing, going back now to London, COVID-wise. The COVID <laughs> sent us home a couple of times, you know, and we had to go back to London again. It was kind of uh, dysfunctional, um, but everything was dysfunctional in the world at that time. You know, everybody was suffering the same thing, everybody with the mask going around and not knowing what is happening. I don't know. I don't taste myself anymore. <laughs> if I get sick, I get sick, like I, I used to do before, period. Exactly. Oh, come on. <laughs> Move on with life. Yeah. Uh, my last question was uh, of what you're most passionate about, but I think you answered it when you said theater. I, I'm sure it's your biggest passion. Is there anything yeah. else? No, that's, that's mm. really my big passion. It's not only... You, I didn't try to make my career what it was at the beginning my vocation, mm -hmm. something that I love to do, regardless of whatever that can bring to you, can bring money, can bring you know, the celebrity <coughs> things, whatever. No, just erase that. It's beautiful for me when they, every night, they say, go oh, see, mm -hmm. five minutes, go, boom, and I go, I sit down there, the lights go on, and I am in that bubble, and I can feel you know, the palpital of the people. I can feel that I am, that we are doing something in which we are doing you know, something together. And I can feel the emotions, I can feel the laughter, I can feel, you know, everything that I'm communicating, I can feel it, it's something very intangible, but at the same, at the same time, it's there. Um, and it's very difficult to explain, but that's, that's why I am an actor. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Not because of all of those beautiful things that brought me. And I have to recognize that there are many parallel lives to, to the life of an actor. And I play all of them. And I think I did it in the most honest way I could. But at the end, now that I am 62 years old, I want to go back to that passion and the love of performing. Um, because there is something in there that is very difficult to explain, um, very subtle, that makes me happy. Yeah. Thank you so much for being so authentic and raw with us today, and, and for taking the time to coming here to Jeddah and, and speaking to us today. Happy to uh, be muchas gracias, happy and uh, good luck for the throat. Antonio Banderas, everyone. Oh. Thank you.